headwaters of you wanted to reach the headwaters of the Ohio River. So the uh, Potomac Company was formed in 1785, and they built a series of five canals, three of which were skirting canals that went around rapids. And there were two areas that ha actually had locks. One was at Little Falls, and the other one was on the Virginia side of Great Falls. The, um, the, the company uh, soon found out that, uh, you know, using the Potomac River had problems. It could only be navigable maybe one or two months a year because of different water levels of the river. Either it was too high or too low. So finally, uh, they went bankrupt by 1828, and the uh, assets of the Potomac Company merged with the, uh, were given to the Sino Canal Company. So on July 4th, 1828, President John Quincy Adams broke ground at Little Falls. And at the same day in Baltimore, the Beano Railroad broke ground. By 1831, the canal opened from Lock 23, which is Violet's Lock today, down to Georgetown. And the canal opened from Harper's Ferry to Georgetown by 1834 after the completion of the Knox Aqueduct. And then by 1850, with the completion of the construction of the Paw Paw Tunnel, the canal opened from Cumberland down to Georgetown, which was 108 in total, 184.5 miles, a cost of 13 million. The entire canal, uh, Sino Canal, has 11 masonry aqueducts, one wood aqueduct, 74 locks, one tunnel, the Paw Paw Tunnel, 240 culverts and seven feeder dams. Now the one wood aqueduct is the trunk aqueduct, which is about a mile above uh, Edwards Ferry, Lock 25. And that had been a uh, culvert, but it got washed out and the canal company in the 1830s replaced it with wooden beams. And ever since that day in 1830 became a, it remained an aqueduct. Prior to the complete, com uh, completion of the canal, agricultural products were shipped. From 1850 to 1923, coal was the main product shipped down from Cumberland. By 1853, the B&O Railroad made it to Ohio and the C&O Canal, they stopped at Cumberland. They were out of funds and they figured that was as far as they were gonna go. So the, the heyday of the canal was between 1870 and 1889. In 1889, disaster struck. There was a massive flood and the canal company went bankrupt. And the same weather system that contributed to the Johnstown flood was the one that came down the Potomac River. By 1890, uh, the, uh, the canal company lost ownership and then by 1891, the canal resumed operation with the Beano Railroad taking over control of the canal. In 1924, there's another great flood and that permanently closed the canal. And 1923 was the last year of operations. In 1938, the Beano Railroad gave the canal to the federal government in exchange of $2 million of debt owed. Then soon after that, the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps was assigned and there were two African-American teams that worked and they had their camps down at Carter Rock and they restored the first 20 miles of the canal. Then in 1942, another flood came and then the World War II also arose and that ended the restoration efforts. By, 19, well, by uh, the early 1940s, the Corps of Engineers, they wanted to build a series of dams across the Potomac River. That's not in my slide, but uh, 
and that would have flooded a lot of the areas like uh, from Great Falls up, like even the Wanakasi Aqueduct would have been underwater uh, and even uh, Harper's Ferry would have been flooded by the people fought against that idea. Then by 1954, there were plans to build a parkway and the Washington Post endorsed that concept. It's also 1954, Supreme Court Justice William Douglas invited editors of the Post for a walk from Cumberland to Georgetown. And after that walk, the Washington Post changed their position after the walk. In 1970, a bill was introduced by Congressman Gilbert Goody and J. Glenn Bell, Jr. of Maryland to make the canal to a National Historical Park. And then there were a couple Boy Scouts, John Wolfe and Mark Stover testified in December 1970 in front of the Senate Committee on Interior and Insular Affairs. And there is a photograph, a Boy Scout, that's me. And there was a Cub Scout, that was Charles Stover. He presented the senators with some Sino Canal Boy Scout patches. And that's Senator, Senator like uh, J. Glenn Bell Jr., who at the time was still a congressman. And that's Gilbert Goody. So one thing that I don't understand is why those two men don't get more credit for establishing the park into a National Historical Park. And we hear about William O. Douglas, but there's no mention of these two gentlemen. So on January 8th, 1971, President Richard Nixon signed the bill designating the Sino Canal, a National Historical Park. I believe at the time when he signed that bill, he was in California. And then in 2015, after I retired from NASA, I became a level walker. And I have two levels between White's Ferry and the Monoxy Aqueduct. So now I'm going to talk about some of the local history where we live in Upper Montgomery County. So before the canal, there were Native Americans that lived along the river, and there were fish wares along the Potomac River. And sometimes when the river is low, you can see them. The early settlers, they had farms along the river. And they also used the same fords across the Potomac River as Native Americans once did, including what's now known as White's Ford. Then there were ferries began, like Conrad's Ferry, which is now White's Ferry, Edwards Ferry, and Nolan's Ferry. Um, also, there was a fellow named Benjamin Latrobe. He found a place near White's Ferry excuse me, Conrad's Ferry at the time, where uh, he, he could find what's called Potomac Marble, where he opened up a quarry that, that quarried the stone between 1817 and 1890, 19 to make columns at the Capitol building. A visitor, Rosie just came down. The, uh, so when the canal company uh, was formed, they began to buy land from the area landowners so the canal could be constructed. Some, at some locks, their pivot bridges were built. In other places, large culverts were constructed to allow passage of wagons, horses, and people to cross beneath the canal. Canal Company allowed the Trundle family near Lock 26 to operate a ferry boat across the canal to allow river access. They uh, also had a large uh, culvert, which is right near the parking lot, the Dickerson Conservation Park parking lot. And that's known as Culvert 65. And that was a passage culvert. And then there's a lot of Civil War history from Pennefield Lock all the way to the Monoxy Aqueduct and saw a variety of action. And anyway, let me continue. So, area of future happenings. There's going to be a new bridge at Edwards Ferry, including signs telling people the direction to Poolsville in the next few years. The bridge that's there now is a temporary bridge. Um, also something that's going on now 
there's going to be some repairs at the Monoxy Aqueduct. If you've been to the aqueduct lately, you'll notice the mule kick boards, or as a canal historian Karen Gray pointed out to me, she saw in the canal records that they are referred to as mule curbs. Uh, those need to be replaced. And uh, probably in September, uh, the Sino Canal Trust, working with the Sino Canal Association, is going to make replace all the mule kick boards and mounts at the Max Aqueduct. And if you figured that'll take one day and we'll do it during the week so it doesn't you know, impact visitors on, on the weekend. Another thing that needs to uh, take place there is the uh, towpath stones. Between several of the stones, the cement is missing or is damaged and that needs to be repaired. Also the historic fence has uh, rust spots in many places, and that needs to be uh, repainted. So hopefully those projects will be completed. I heard also from the park that the canal is gonna be dredged from Violet Slot down to Great Falls, and that's gonna be get, begin in the fall of 2021. It's gonna continue into the uh, first part of 2022. Also, 2021, there's going to be tree trimming along the towpath to remove hazardous trees. And I know when that occurs, they close off part of the towpath. Something else that's probably going to happen in 2021 are going to be more senior walks, pulls those senior walks. Hooray! Something else that's <laughs> going on that's going to be uh, it's sponsored by the Sino Canal Association is the World Canals Conference in Hagerstown. And that event's gonna be from August 30th to September 2nd, 2021. And here's a link for detailed information. And you can go on the Sino Canal Association website to find out more. The uh, whoop, restoration of the Seneca Aqueduct, you know, it's been 50 years ago, well, September 11th, 1971. There was a storm and I've been told that there was a earthen dam broke up in the Montgomery Village area. And that caused, the, and there was a heavy rain that caused flooding and houses and trees and whatever else came down that Seneca Creek knocked out one of the arches. So I did write the superintendent and she wrote back, and this was just last week. And she thanked me and she is assigning her staff the task to determine how it can be restored, you know, whether or not it can be restored. Another project nearby is the uh, clearing out the Goose Creek Inlet Lock. Um, I brought that up to different people's attention, and I have an idea of how that can happen possibly, but I need to work on that one. And that's near uh, Edwards Ferry. That was a uh, inlet lock that connected the boats coming across from Virginia from Goose Creek so they could access the Sino Canal. Right now it's overgrown, there's trees growing you know, through the stones. Also, I've been mentioning to the park and anybody who listen, we need to have a wayside historical sign for the Latrobe's Marble Quarry. All right, safety. If you're walking on the towpath, you need to watch out for cyclists and stay to the right so cyclists may pass you on your left. Um, and I guess one thing I often do, I sort of look over my shoulder from time to time. When visiting the park, tell someone where you'll be going, take water with you in the summertime and watch out for ticks and snakes. I've had a few ticks, I've, got off of me so far this year. Try not to visit the park on a windy day. There are many older trees, including dead ash trees. Trees do get uprooted or lose their branches from time to time. And just last week, I was walking on a towpath with a friend and we stopped suddenly because we heard this cracking up, up high in, in the tree. 
and all of a sudden we watched in front of us branches came down crashing and crashed onto the towpath about 10 feet in front of us. So, so after it crashed and we looked at each other, I said, I wonder if the cyclists would stop to help us or just ride around us. Uh, another thing you should, if you walk your dog on a towpath, the park policy is you need to keep your dogs leashed. Uh, people have been known to lose their dogs because they run off after something like a wild animal, like a squirrel. Also, at times, there are many cyclists who could run into a loose dog. Now, I've provided you with some canal information that helped me with my knowledge since I began getting more involved with the canal. So there's a book called The Potomac Canal by Robert Capsch. Another book called The Great National Project, The History of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal by Walter S. Sanderlin. The Chesapeake and Ohio Canal Official National Park Handbook. And that can be purchased through the CNO Canal Association website. The Monocacy Monocle, I write stories from time to time for the Monocle and other people write stories about the canal. That can be found. And the monocles also online. There was a great book about the Civil War uh, along the canal, Trembling in the Balance. And that was written by Timothy Snyder. And then another book that tells you a lot about the canal, including all the culverts and uh, other structures, this Hopath Guide to the Sino Canal by Thomas Hahn. And that can be purchased through the Sino Canal Association website. Also, the Sino Canal Association has a lot of canal history on their website, um, including uh, uh, canal families. Uh, there's newspaper articles about the canal. Um, what else? Oh, and there's other stories that people like even Paul Kreingold, he has a story about the, the Lost History of Potomac Marble. And also you can find out about how to become a member on the uh, CNO Canal Association website. Right now for a single person membership is $15 and for two people or families, 20. And I think beginning October, the dues will be going up a little bit. Uh, more books, there's the Sino Canal Companion by Mike Kai. And then there's a book that, uh, another book, Robert Capsch and his wife, Perry Capsch has written about the Monoxy Aqueduct. Also, there are seven lock houses available to stay. And those are called canal quarters. And you can look on the Sino Canal Trust website to find out about staying in a lock house. Well, the most modern lock house I understand is the one at Swain's Lock. It has both air conditioning and heat, running water and bathrooms inside and a kitchen. So, so that's it for now. Now I'm gonna show you a variety of photos I've taken over the past few years on my walks along the canal plus some old pictures I found about pictures of our area. So here's a box turtle. So th th there's the one on the left, he was on the towpath and this one I know is buried under a tree stump. And I, I was walking near mile post 40. And that great blue heron was staring down at me and I was a little bit nervous to walk beneath it because the way it was looking at me looked like he didn't want me around. So I moved quickly away after I took the picture. Here's another one near milepost 40 and it was sunning itself. I had never seen that before. I've seen vultures do that, but never a great blue heron. And here's a family of Canada geese. And this I took uh, in the canal at Great Falls. Here's an egret, which is in the water near uh, Lock 26. 
just below lock 26. And the same egret flew off. I was able to get a blurry picture of it. And here's a, a green heron. And here's some wood ducks near mile post 40. Here's a muskrat in the water near uh, lock 27, which is towards the Monocacy Aqueduct. And here's some turtles. I forget the names of these, these sliders. But, and this snapping turtle I saw with my son Charles, he's the one that saw it. He nudged me, and then he pointed. And this was taken in March a few years ago. And it looked like it was just emerging from hibernation. And, and that's a big snapping turtle. And I think it's still around because I've seen a large one near milepost 37. And here were two snapping turtles up near Williamsport. They seemed to be fighting. They kept wrestling, turning and twisting. And here they are face to face before they went at it again. I guess they were fighting over territory. This, I was on a walk up near Harper's Ferry. I'd never seen snapping turtles sharing, you know, logs sunning uh, with other turtles. This is a pileated woodpecker. Those are hard to take pictures of. And this is a green snake that crossed in front of me on the towpath near the Monoxy Aqueduct. And I got up close to it because I saw this water spot drop, drop on its head. Took another picture and didn't look too happy. And here's another unhappy snake. It was a black snake. This is in March where the uh, bluebells start to emerge out of the ground. And here's the bluebells, more bluebells, bluebells. And this is uh, a patch of bluebells by Lock 27. That's my wife. I think that's violet she has, it's shown. And these are flocks that I took, I think last year, and the river was high near uh, down below Violet's Lock and dam number two. And these are Dutchman breaches and that's violet. And these are grape hyacinth. They're along the canal. There's so many, many flowers. I have so many pictures of flowers. I just put some of them on. These are pawpaw tree blossoms. And these are pawpaws and they are ripe in like late summer, like early September. And this is a zebra swallowtail. They like to lay their eggs on a, the pawpaw tree leaves and the larvae eat the leaves. And those are a couple of right pawpaws. And uh, they have like a custard flavor and they're sort of like thick like custard. Native, Native Americans enjoyed eating them. And also George Washington enjoyed uh, chilled pawpaws. Not sure how he chilled them, maybe put them in water. And that one pawpaw I ate had nine seeds. I counted those today. You can see some of the custard look about them. They're very delicious. This is a May apple blossom. And the when the May apple is ripe, you can actually eat it. Native Americans ate them. And that's me with the smaller dogs, rosy, bigger dogs, violet. It's lock 27. And you can see a, one point, the uh, lock was repaired because on the left side, it's uh, the red Seneca sandstone. On the right side is cement. And that's another view of lock 27 in the lock house. 
and that's Lockhouse 27, right after it got a new roof, new gutters and downspout. And that's another thing that had a problem that I, I guess I sort of got excited about. There was a there was a tree that fell on the roof, crashed into the roof. It took, I don't know, maybe, so it fell like March 1st, maybe 2017. And every opportunity I had, I brought up to the park that, you know, you need to remove the tree on the, from the roof and then replace the roof. So finally, January 2018, came along and sure enough it had been repaired tree removed and repaired and this is a, a spotted turtle it was near the uh, monoxy aqueduct and these are rare turtles and this is a great blue heron i went down to the uh, little monoxy river in front of culvert 69 I saw this great blue heron, so I took its picture. And this is culvert 69 on the uh, upstream side of the Little Monocacy River. And this is culvert 68, which is below Lock 27. I'm always fascinated by the waterfall. Sometimes the river rises in and you can't see the waterfall, like it'll rise almost to the top of that culvert. This is culvert 65. This picture was taken in December of 2017. This is the culvert that uh, the Trundles used at their farm and other people going to and from trying to get to the other side to cross like at White's Ford. This also is the culvert that the Confederates infantry used in 18, September 1862 to cross the canal because the canal had water. And from there, they ended up going up to Frederick and then eventually to Antietam. Inside this culvert, that's carved 1832. And then this is the Trundle Barn, which we've seen on Martinsburg Road. And that was, uh, oral history says it was built by uh, canal stonemasons. Also, I've been told that this possibly was the Confederates' first headquarters in Maryland on their, you know, in, on, for their Maryland campaign in 1862. This is looking down from the towpath at the Little Monoxy River. It was flooded. And I'm standing on top of Culvert 69. This is what the trunk aqueduct looks like today. There's a bridge over Broad Run. And I, <laughs> I, I thought that would make a good picture. So there's a heavy snow. So I took all my energy and effort to walk up from Edwards Ferry on the snow path. The snow was deep. And then um, right before I got this picture, I slipped and fell in the snow. Fortunately, I didn't fall in the water. And then this was taken in July 2018. Let me back up, June 2018. And this is the mule rise uh, just below Lock 26 when uh, the Potomac River flooded. That's the towpath. This is uh, some damage near Pennyfield Lock to the towpath. The Park Service repaired it. This is from June 2018. This was the last time the Monocacy Aqueduct had water in it. And these people were playing in it. And you can see farther up the picture, there's a water in the prison. And this is good old White's Ferry in 2018, with some flooding. And this is the view of the Monoxy Aqueduct from behind Lockhouse 27, Monoxy Aqueduct. 
or Malaxiac would look. And some of the stones from the, uh, well, all the stones from the Malaxiac book came from the Johnson quarries, which were behind, uh, which is uh, now in the Monoxy Natural Management Resource area. And the uh, stones at the uh, Monoxiac Everyone hang in there. It seems like we might have a connection issue. See John is joining back. Thank you everyone so much for your patience. Good. The host has asked you to start your video. All right. So how's that? We're all good. All right. Bye. All right, so I've left off here with the, uh, this is the red, one of the red, this is the red quarry at the Johnson quarries. And this is, a, this is where I lost you. This is a sunset at the mouth of Monocacy River. And on a, I like to get to the canal right after it snowed, just to see what animals walked in the snow and call this picture Deer Highway because deer use the Monocacy Aqueduct. I guess they use it at night. So you see all the deer tracks, incredible. And then this is one of the mule kick boards that are need to be replaced at the Monocacy Aqueduct. And this is an example of the cement between the stones. This is another sunset picture at the Monocacy Aqueduct, and it's the mouth of the uh, Monocacy and the Potomac River. And this is an example of the historic fence that needs to be uh, wire brushed and repainted. Some high water Great Falls. Uh, this is just a wide angle view of figuring out how to use on my cell phone of Great Falls. This is a flooding Great Falls more high water Great Falls. And one thing I've gotten involved with since about 2017 are Potomac River cleanups. And this is some of the stuff that was behind Lockhouse 27 one time. And the uh, Boy Scouts and other volunteers are in this picture, moving the barrels down the towpath. And this is some of the tires we found at the Monocacy Aqueduct one year. And that's my brother and that's Steve Horvat. And this is some of the stuff we gathered. And there's the group and not everybody's in the picture. And anyone know who that is? I was picking up trash and I asked her, do you need any help? And she yelled back, no, that's a hot water heater. And, that, and that's my wife. And there it is in the back of the uh, dump truck. This was taken this year and uh, this is at White's Ferry. And this is looking down from the uh, old iron bridge. And these are Boy Scouts filling up the dump truck. And then periodically the Monox aqueduct gets tree debris piled up against it. And this is the park pays for people to remove, uh, contractors to remove the tree debris. And it comes down the Monocacy River and sometimes it's piled up against the uh, Route 28 bridge. And I've also seen it piled up against the railroad bridge that's up river it all flows down. And this is an example of the new uh, towpath surface. Makes for the cyclists love it. And earlier I was talking about uh, some tree limbs that fell. Well, this is what fell in front of a friend and I. And I've taken some of you all who've been on the walks this is White's Ford and uh, 
you know, there was a lot of activity through the centuries, including you know, Native Americans use this, uh, early settlers, farmers, and uh, you know, there there were three uh, three yeah you know, there were three significant Confederate crossings here, and eventually uh, the Union Army got wise and and they built a fort right above uh, White's Fort and looks down. One day last fall, I was walking by the Marble Quarry Hiker Biker campsite. And I came across this, and there's a gentleman. Uh, he pedaled from Harve de Grasse to here, and uh, he had spent the night before in Barnesville. And uh, he, he said uh, it took him a month to get this far. And the next morning, he wanted to pedal to White's Ferry where uh, maybe it was two falls ago, but you know, the ferry was open. He was gonna take the ferry across the Leesburg and he was hoping to find someone with a truck who could take him down to North Carolina where the winters are milder. I, I haven't seen him since. And this is the Monoxy Aqueduct. And little did I know that the Sugarloaf Mountain towers over top of it. And Rusty Smith gave me a boat ride not too long ago, and I took that picture. And this is a picture of Lockhouse 26, and you can see the farm field behind it. So that was once the Trundle Farm. This was taken in 1948, and now it's just a forest back there. This picture was taken in the early 1900s. And this is again, Black House 26. And you can see to the right of this woman, there's a mounting block. And you notice the trees. So in this location, there's the giant silver maple tree. So if this is the early 1900s, like around the turn of the century. It tells you that maple tree, it's old. It's not 300 years old. And the mounting block in the late 1980s, when the park was stabilizing the canal walls, they shoved the mounting block into the woods on the edge of the park property. And you can see the uh, drill marks in the mounting block. And this is a view of the lock house today, what's left of it, because it burned down in 1969. And that's one of the trees that was probably in the picture I showed you just months before. And this was last Halloween. Someone put these jack-o'-lanterns there at the lock. This is Lock 24 and the Seneca Aqueduct. People call this today Riley's Lock. And this is what collapsed. It was three arches and the stone was quarried at the Seneca Quarry, which is nearby. So this happened almost 50 years ago. And this is a view looking across and there are volunteers with the Sino Canal Association. They were removing uh, vegetation from the lock walls. If you, and this is the aqueduct walls. We also did the lock walls. Now, if you ever have an opportunity you can look closely at the uh, inside the lock and also on the uh, aqueduct walls, the, uh, st some of the stonemasons carved their marks in the stone. This is another view looking up Seneca Creek, and this is the, where the arch fell. And this is another uh, picture of the uh, trunk aqueduct after the uh, canal closed, but that shows just it was wooden. These uh, abutments are still there, and, and now there's a bridge across for uh, people to cross the towpath. These, these are mushrooms inside the pawpaw tunnel, and this is the pawpaw tunnel I took from uh, one of the entrances. And I took this picture. This is Dam 4. 
And Paul Kreingold took this picture. I, I'm standing against the back wall of the marble quarry. And this was a nice hike. Maybe we can do with the pools of seniors. This is above Harper's Ferry, and it's about two miles down from Dargan Bend. And this was a very large uh, iron mine, what's left of it. There's also a haunted lock house still standing on the hillside. I, didn't, I don't have a picture of that to show you. And you can see the red on the right, that's iron. Here's a picture of Lockhouse 25, Edwards Ferry. I took this the same day, I took the picture of the snowy picture of the trunk aqueduct. And this is looking through Lock 25, Edwards Ferry. This is an example of the vegetation that's growing in the inlet lock near Edwards Ferry. And this is the uh, river entrance to the inlet lock. And you can see the trees are growing. All this stuff needs to be cleared out or the nature is going to overtake the, you know, the stone structure that was there. And then this is Edwards Ferry during canal operating days. And you can see the lock house. Back then, it had a front porch, and a fellow named Jim Poole provided this photo to me for me to use. And that's the old Jarbo's store. And you can see part of the pivot bridge. And there's, there's also a store on the canal here, and also the uh, lock keeper's shanty where they kept an eye out for the boats. And this canal boat is heading up the canal and it's loaded down. So it had something uh, on board that got from probably Georgetown, taking it up the river. And that's all I have. I see some questions in the chat that we can start with. Okay. The first one is, where is the Seneca Aqueduct? Where is the Seneca Aqueduct? It's down, um, it's at Riley's Lock. Um, if you know where uh, Pool Store is, and what's that, the road going down? Is that Riley's Lock Road? It's, I think it is. Yeah, well, that's where it is. Could you talk a little bit about the lock tenders? Uh, well, they didn't get paid very much. Um, right now, I've been writing stories about different lock houses and locks. So right now, I'm written. I'm writing stories about uh, the Edwards Ferry Lock House, Lock 25. Um, they, uh, the canal company, preferred married men, and it seemed like they had if they had older children. That was better. Uh, some lock keepers stayed a very long time, and the lock keepers there's a husband and wife that were lock keepers at the uh, lock 25 in, in this picture they were there from about the early 1870s well into the 1880s maybe into the early 1890s uh, it was lock keeper at the uh, lock 27 his last name was walter I forget his first name it's thomas walter and he was there for many years, maybe at least 20 years. And he had a family. And uh, he was the one that uh, fought with the Confederates to keep them from blowing up the Moxie Aqueduct because they loved the aqueduct. So he compromised with them. So they damaged the uh, culvert 69 of the Little Moxie River and they drained the canal there. And he got in trouble with the canal company. He was fired, but then his friends uh, spoke up for him and he was reinstated. And at lock 26, that's known as Woods Lock. And the last lock keeper there was Alfred Woods. And he's the son of Charles and Columbia Wood. And I found that, so there's not very much written about the lock keepers. And what I've been doing is looking in the census for the uh, for the Medley District Census, and also Montgomery County, 
of finding lock keepers that have not been documented in any of these canal history books. And I hope to get back to the archives in College Park so I can do more research, to try to pinpoint the exact times when they were lock keepers. Uh, most of the lock keepers that I found for from uh, Seneca, you know, lock 24, 25, 26, and 27, they are buried along with their families in the Monocacy Cemetery. So that that so one day I was up there and I had all the I had all the names written down and I had all the burial plots, you know, the names. And Glenn Wallace, he helped me locate all the graves. Uh, th there were, there's been tragedy along the stretch of the canal. And uh, in, on Halloween, October 31st, 1911, uh, the lock keeper at, uh, at the lock 27, lock keeper then was John Walther and his wife was Fanny, and she, during the night, disappeared, and he found her drowned in the canal at the lock the next morning. She's buried at the uh, Monoxy Cemetery. So the uh, children, uh, depends on where they lived. Some of them uh, went to the uh, Seneca Schoolhouse. There's another schoolhouse I come across like in the history of Poolsville and also on old maps, there's a marble quarry school, which is in the vicinity, well, it is in Martinsburg, but the, I, no one seems to know where that school was exactly located. It might've been a framed structure, so it's long gone. Our and next... and oh. early on the children, a lot of them, uh, didn't couldn't read or write, but then as the years progressed, they became more educated. They could read and write. No, That's such an interesting connection with Monocacy Cemetery. We've also had a presentation by Glenn Wallace, and some of his documentation is so fascinating. Um, our next question is: Where can the fish wares be seen? Um. <laughs> Well, so so there's there's one that can be seen when the water is low, and it's about mile 38.5. And the, the way I saw it was um, the towpath is very close to the river, and Doug Zavere and a fellow named Steve Horvat they watched me walk out onto the fishware last summer. The water was very low, and the water was very warm. And I got that one also has what seems like remnants of an apex where, where the, they would channel the fish to the uh, tip of the uh, fishware. So that's one place. And, and there's some below Nolan's Ferry too, you can see from the canal, but you can only see them when the water's low. Our next question is, are you going to share your pawpaw recipes? Um, I have one, I made pawpaw salsa last fall, and that recipe made it to the Monoxy Monocle, but I have that written down and I can share that. I think that would be awesome to be able to share on our blog if you would send that. Okay, I'm sure yeah. there's if plenty I, of people I, who are if interested. I if I forget, you know where to find me. Yes, we do. Our next question is, what can you tell us about the Washington City Canal? Did it extend all the way to Anacostia? No, I um, mean, I think it went as far as the Navy Yard. So in, in, that's where the Anacostia River is. And does anyone have any, well, I think William Bauman might be on this. He may know, he's a, he's a very good canal historian. Uh, but from my remembrance, and Paul Krangle may know, it, 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 it stopped at the, where the Navy Yard is today. Do you remember what you talked about when you testified as a Boy Scout? Yes. 
I still have works. I still have my speech. I think that got published in the Monocacy Monocle too. I can share that with you if you like. Yeah, that would be awesome. All right, remind what, me. What's the thing that this. you remember most about testifying? Well, I remember my um, mother and father, they drove me you know, from our house in Silver Spring down to the Capitol. And that day I had a terrific sore throat, horrible sore throat, but I wasn't gonna miss this opportunity. And I was very nervous. And then the chairman of the Senate subcommittee, he told me to make it brief because they're very busy. And I was the third person to testify that day. The first person was uh, Senator Mathias. The second person was Congressman Goody, and I was the third person. So when I finished my talk, the uh, Senator, I think his name was Nelson, he wasn't happy with me because I gave my whole speech. And he said, I hope the next scout uh, is shorter. So the next guy, Mark Stover, he just submitted his speech for the record. So he didn't really talk. And so after that, Gilbert Goody thanked me, you know, you know, as, as, you know it was over and we, they had a break. So I went home with my parents and I was a sophomore then in high school at Montgomery Blair High School in Silver Spring. How would you find volunteer positions for care of the CNO Canal, including cleanup? Well, um, the CNO Canal Association has volunteer positions, and also the uh, CNO Canal Trust has volunteer positions. So those are two places people can look. And I guess part of me, you know, I mean, being involved is, you know, you see something that needs to be done, and I ask about it. And, you know, I don't want to be too pushy, but sometimes, you know, I just don't like the answer, so I keep at it. So I've been after these repairs of an oxy aqueduct for at least four years. And then like the trash along the river was horrible. And I didn't get any support until someone whispered in my ear, uh, contact the Alice Ferguson Foundation. So I did. And they, I ended up working with the Seno Canal Trust to uh, do these river cleanups. So I, I, took, I took the initiative. Back in the 90s, Monocacy Aqueduct seemed in really bad shape. How would you rate its overall condition today? Oh, uh, it's, it's outstanding. It's an outstanding condition. Um, you know, the, the things that I'm mentioning or see are just are small items just to make it, you know, bring it, bring it back up to, you know, I guess what I call close to perfection, you know, the way it was in operating days. Because if uh, things need to be done, like if there's cement that was missing in, in the towpath, the canal company repaired it. Or if the mule uh, curbs were rotting or disappearing, they repaired it. So, you know, anything with any, any structure along the park needs to be maintained because um, just like our own homes, periodically they require maintenance. I see a comment from Brenda saying in regards to pawpaw harvest, if they are on the ground, they can be taken from the park. And if still on the tree, they are property of the park. That's a good thing to know if you're watching this presentation and thinking of maybe trying a pawpaw recipe of your own. And, and, and I'll tell you something else about the pawpaws on the trees. They are not ripe. So leave them be, wait till they fall to the ground. And in one of the pictures, there was a paw, two pawpaws in my hand. One was cracked. That's because it cracked when it hit the ground. How can you tell which ones are ripe? They're mushy. You know, when you, when you put them in your hands and you squeeze them, like you're squeezing the Charmin, like you squeeze the pawpaw. 
How many picnic tables have you painted on the canal towpath? Um, I painted, I think about 30. And a friend of mine, Steve Horvat, he's painted 12. I also see a comment from Scott pointing out that pawpaw trees are native and support local wildlife. I think yes. that's a, always a good thing to consider is different plant species that actually promote our local environment as well. Do we have any more questions for John? Now is a great time to unmute and ask or feel free to send them in the chat as well. Well, if we have no further questions, I just want to say thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's presentation as much as I did and learned something new. If you think of any questions, you can always email us later at info at poolsvilleseniors.org. And if you'd like to unmute or turn on your camera to say goodbye, now is the time. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, please leave a like and a comment. We'd like to thank John so much for this presentation, as well as our ongoing sponsors and private contributors that help us keep our programs going because we love putting them on for you. If you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider joining us for more upcoming events. This time next week, we'll be back with the Hoeing family discussing their multi-generational connections to Poolsville. You can check out our website, poolsvilleseniors.org for more info and registration as always. Hopefully we will be back soon with a recipe of pawpaws from John. Um, thank you all so much for attending and have a wonderful evening.